Praise the Lord. We'll have one class. The children go down to your church. Um, the rest of us will remain here for one class. The youths, the youths, you have to move to where you you are, and. Uh, the men and women, we have one class. Young adult, you know where you are, you are supposed to be. The, 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 the rest of us that are adult here, or the senior citizens, we remain seated where we are. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to thank God for the privilege we have in his presence to come and learn at his feet one more time. And I want us to bow down our heads with the praying. I want to first thank God for the love that lifted us out of the dungeon of despair, out of an hopeless pathway that we were trailing before. Let's begin to thank God for the love that wiped we are yet sinners. Christ died for us. And that's why you and I are here today. Give him glory, give him praise. And begin to commit your heart, heart into the hand of the Lord. Say, Oh Lord, reveal your mind to me this morning. Reflect your nature into me this morning. Teach me your word and let your word have a place in my heart. Let your word mix with faith in my heart. Make me a doer of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege we have to present ourselves before you. We thank you for the love that lifted us out of the pit of damnation and that positioned us to be on this pathway of redemption. We are forever grateful to you. Be thou exalted, Lord, in Jesus' name. This morning we have come to look into your word. We recognize you as the bread of life. We pray as we look into the scriptures, give us, open our heart of understanding, give us interpretation and right application of your word and corresponding grace to live up to expectation in Jesus' name. Thank you for answering our prayers, Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. We are all welcome to his presence in Jesus' name. Uh, this morning, we have a very important topic about us on holiness and hospitality. Holiness, which hospitality. Uh, test, a memory verse will be taken from the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. 1 Peter 1, verse 22. I will read from here, then we'll read together after the count of two. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 22, rather. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the spirit unto of faint love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. And we read together after the count of two. One to go. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto of faint love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. First, first Peter chapter 1, verse 22. And my prayer to God that the Holy Spirit, the purifier of the believer, 
we purify our soul and we'll begin and you also em and, uh, empower us with the grace to obey the truth as he reveals the truth to us this morning in jesus name holiness with hospitality the goal of our lesson this morning is to remind us and to acquaint us with the importance of holiness and hospitality our objective will be to find a balance between holiness and hospitality. And our overall lesson target, as we trust the Holy Spirit towards the end of this teaching, is we'll focus on contextual modeling of holiness and hospitality in this contemporary world of ours. And I pray to God that the Holy Spirit himself will imprint upon our hearts this concept in Jesus name our test will be taken from the book of Luke chapter 10 verse 30 to 37 we need a first reader to help us Luke chapter 10 anyone can please help us to read Luke chapter 10 verse 30 to 37 And Jesus, answering said, and Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed on the, by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, and passed by the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I'll repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Thank you very much. Once again, the topic is holiness with hospitality. The scripture teaches that without holiness, no man shall do what? No man shall see the Lord. And it's high time we sound this loud and clear. In this age and time, even the unbelievers them, themselves know that the world is at an edge things are going the other way around. Even the neutral man in the society knows that something is wrong with this generation. And before you know it, man will rather destroy himself or put himself, position himself for with in, or, uh, irreparable danger. And but there is a way, there is a hope for believers. There is a hope for us. Tell your neighbor there is hope for you. Hope for yes, and what is that hope? Christ has come to prepare a place for us. A place beyond the blue sky. A place where there will be no more tumor, where there will be no more pain, no more crying, no more anxiety, no more fear, no more threat. And for us to get to that place, we need holiness. But we need to sound it loud and clear that without holiness, no man shall see God. Without holiness, nobody with a corrupt mind can see God. Nobody with a perverse heart can see God. Nobody with unclean lips can see God. Nobody with a defiled conscience can see God. There is no room for sinners in heaven. Holiness, holiness and holiness is the holy condition. The holy entrance condition that can make us enter into the kingdom of heaven. And like our G.S. said yesterday in, when he was preaching, he said, we need this virtue in us so that when they talk about the rapture, you are not afraid. When they talk about the world is coming to an end, you are not afraid. When they talk of, oh, there are 1,000 left falling on the left hand, 10,000 are falling on the right hand, you are not afraid because you know you have 
a visa that can carry you beyond the blue sky. The Lord will help us, and we all have this in our possession, and nothing will tarnish our story, nothing will tarnish our stand before God in Jesus' name. We must also understand, as I said earlier, we need to find a balance between holiness and hospitality. God demands practical holiness from every believer in Christ. However, it detests holiness without compassion. So we must understand that when we talk about hospitality, just like we read this, like we sang this morning, love lifted me. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they were doing. That's the kind of love that we need to, uh, we need to back up, I mean, to support our profession, confession, and practice of holiness. Our text today opens with the parable of the, uh, with, with this parable of this man, the Samaritan man, uh, who helped somebody who was a victim of bandits. And Jesus answered said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves. This parable was a product of the question, uh, uh, the response of Jesus to the question raised by a lawyer, and what do we have to learn from this lesson? We must understand that every sincere seeker must desire to know the nature of holiness that will get him to heaven. We see in our text today different characters that had an encounter with this man, with this victim. First on the list in verse 31, say, and by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. He did nothing about it. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But the Levite, the Levite went a, little, a step further. The Levite did not just see. He came by. He stopped by. He looked upon the situation. But because of the protocol of his duty, he went ahead and left the man in pain. But the scripture says in verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, no title. No title of a worker in the church. No title of, no title of maybe, a, 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 of, or no office title. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had what? Compassion on him. And this is what Jesus wants us to emulate. Having compassion. If we say we are Christians, can we show compassion? And to answer the question of the lawyer who came to Jesus, Jesus posed another question to him in verse 36. He said, which now of these three thinkest thou was a neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And that brings me to the first question. I'll be having two questions in one. I'll be having an interactive session this morning. So the first question is, you want to go to a man, you want to turn to a man. If you're a man, you turn to a man. If you're a woman, you turn to a woman. And then we'll come back, we'll come back after four minutes. And then so we'll sample two opinions from each of the groups. Now, the first question is, I want to ask your partner, I mean your neighbor, who is a neighbor to you? And the second question you'll be asking yourself is, peradventure you'll find yourself in the shoe of the priest. But eventually you find yourself in the shoe of the Levite. What will you do differently? So I will give us four minutes, brother to brother, sister to sister. Then we'll come back. Who is a neighbor to you? And for eventually you find yourself in the shoe of a Levite, of the Levite. What will you do differently? For eventually you find yourself in the shoe of the priest. What will you do differently? If you are online, for those on YouTube and Zoom, uh, you can also send in your text message. Uh, who is a neighbor to you? 
and if you find yourself in the shoe of the Levite, what will you do differently? You find yourself in the shoe of the priest, what will you have done differently? Send in your text, and the media can help us um, lay it as, as, as I went you. All right, so let's begin to wrap up. Yes, do we have any group who want to share with us from the brothers? Yes, so you discuss with us what you tell us, what you do, what you shared within your group, uh, who is a neighbor, and what will you have done differently? Yes, you can go to the microphone, sir. Thank you. Good morning, church. So uh, my brother and I went over um, what a neighbor should be. So we came up with two different versions of a neighbor. You have the biblical description of a neighbor, and you also have the English version of a website which tells you a neighbor is somebody who's nearer to you. And then the biblical version of it is somebody who's in need that you render help to, not expecting anything in return. So this is what this, the study centers around. And um, by adventure, if I had um, find myself in that situation, what I could have done different, um, I probably would have gone to him, just like the Samaritan, the Samaritan did, try to render him help. But that is not what we saw happen. I mean, was it racially motivated? Or was it because um, the priest thought by him doing that, he was going to defy his position of a priesthood? So those are our... Thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate that. One key takeaway is some gave us two definitions from the dictionary and from the Christian perspective. So we need to migrate from, the, from just the theoretical definition to what Bible expects us to do. And another takeaway from that is that not expecting a return. We'll, dwell, we'll do much on that. There's, from the sister's uh, perspective, go ahead, sister. Thank you. Good morning, church. Um, a neighbor is someone that is um, near you anywhere, anytime, at, the, at any point in time. And what I would have done different for what this prince uh, done is that at any particular uh, in time, our religion activity should not substitute our practical um, concern of helping people that are in need. And also, we should help people with um, the act of inconveniencing ourselves, like going extra mile. We don't mind uh, for our own program to be distracted for going extra mile to help people in need. And also, we should be generous, and this should be um, a um, this should be a continuous um, a continuous um, help. That it's not like we just do it, and we should make sure that we help all the way. We give all, we go all out. Amen. Thank you very much. That's very comprehensive. Uh, for brevity of time, I will just limit myself to those two contribution, and uh, I will quickly make reference to point number one: condemnable attributes of the priest and the Levite, and then going by what our brother and our sister has just told us, we must understand that a neighbor is somebody, not just a dictionary definition like our, our daddy told us here, but somebody who is in need, who needs your support. Anywhere, anybody, irrespective of race, like our sister also shared with us, irrespective of what is going on, and of course, going an extra mile, that's another key, key word in uh, the definition of our sister, Going an extra mile, the story of, was told about a, uh, a, a one young man in London, on the street of London, who got stranded within snow, during snow time. And he has been walking, trying to see if he could catch up to get to his destination. But the snow was so heavy that 
he got exhausted while doing that. And the next thing was just to give up. If you have ever been in that situation, I've been there before, where it's as if nothing can work. If I was with my phone and the code entered my phone, my phone died, I could not call, I could not trace any boss and what have you. So this man was stranded, and the next thing was to say his last prayer. He would close his eyes and waiting for death. But there was somebody who spotted him for, from afar off, and he took, went out of his way, took his wagon, plowed through the snow, rescued the man, rescued the man, brought him in, put him inside the eater, and to what is what our brother said, because I like this inter interactive session, he said, not expecting anything bad. The man wanted to say, please, can you please take this money for helping me out of this situation? He said, no. He said, he's not taking any money. He said, okay, what is your name? That at least I should be able to pray for you. He said, if you can tell me the name of the good Samaritan who rescued the man that was a victim of the bandit, then I will tell you my name. So he was not expecting any, he didn't collect any money, he didn't tell him his name, and he said, and that was it. So we must understand that a neighbor is somebody who is in need, not necessarily somebody you know from Adams, but at the same time, when, when, when I said, how can we model this art of hospitality in this contemporary time? We must understand that no matter the title we carry, no matter the office we function in, in the church, or wherever we find ourselves, we must be ready to practice this. And of course, with wisdom. In this contemporary time of our age, if you find yourself running to church and you come across something like that on the road, what will you do differently? I've heard from you, but I know we all have different ideas. But naturally, if you ask me, the first thing is I have several options. Number one, you want to place, if you have a witness beside you, let the person call 911, all right, while you are trying to give the help. If you are delegated to do something in church, Quickly give a call to the pastor or your leader. I'm running late. There's an emergency I'm attending to. If the situation is so critical and you don't want to, you don't want any allegation to backfire against you, take a picture of this scenario before you start your intervention. So these are practical steps of what we can do in this age and time because we have to bring it to our own context. We have to bring it to our own contemporary world. Take a picture of the scenario. If you have somebody around you, let the person call 911 while you're doing that. And I learned a lesson from a groom who had just returning from their wedding reception, uh, uh, the uh, newly wedded couple, returning from their wedding reception. And as they were leaving, of course, just planning for just getting out of the reception hall, they ran into an, an accident, they saw an accident on their way, and the victim of the accident was bleeding profusely. The groom was saying, come on, let's go. The, we, the, 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 the victim will get some other help. The wife said, no, we can't just leave this person in pain. The groom was after honeymoon. Uh, his mind was uh, after honeymoon. But the wife said, no, forget about honeymoon for now. What the, girl, what the, woman, what the newly wedded uh, wife did was so challenging. She tore a white garment, that white garment, tore pieces of it to find the one to stop the blood from flowing. She doesn't mind. It's staying on our home wedding. I know women, we cherish our wedding garment, right? We cherish it. You, you at least, even if you are not going to wear it again, you want to hang it somewhere, you can show that you can show to your next generation. But this woman went out of our way. So we must understand that the art of the priest and, uh, and the Levite is condemnable, and we must avoid it. Matthew chapter 9, verse 13 said, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Mercy, very, very crucial. Point number two, quickly. Commendable attitude of the Samaritan. What did we notice in the Samaritan? He gave his best. He gave his best. If you go back to verse 33 to verse 35, he gave out money. He bounded him up with oil and wine. And he also promised to follow up. He promised to follow up. So we must understand that we must show a little bit, like one of our sons said, show a little bit of love and kindness. Never go along with hatred, blindness. Take a little time to put on joy and wear a happy face. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Convincing application, point number three, convincing application by the Lord. Convincing application by the Lord. So what do we see? The Lord wants us to put this into practice. Jesus then com uh, comment. Uh, uh, there was a scenario in the situation of the disciples. When the disciples, when Jesus, after resurrection, Peter 
he was a family man. Before we blame Mr. Peter, let's put ourselves in his shoe. He was a family man. Probably he has two or three children. And they were saying, Daddy, we need food. You have been following Jesus all this while long. We need to eat. Peter had to say, Come on. Hey, James, John, I go out fishing. I need to take care of something. So Peter went and he went out fishing. And some of the disciples went with him. When Jesus returned, when Jesus appeared to them, Jesus did not crucify him. That's the first thing we people will do in this age and time. He knew that Peter needs food. So the first thing was to address the issue of hunger. Say, children, do you have anything to eat? Or my eat. It was after he had said to the he addressed the issue of hunger. Then now begin, Peter, do you love me more than this? Feed my lamp. Do you love me more than this? Feed my sheep. That message sink deeper than assuming Jesus had really addressed him. So can we begin to address this arm? Correct, we can make more positive impact when we show love. Now, I used to have, a, there was a particular student who was acting out simple in front of me, and uh, when I tried to challenge him, he denied what he was doing, and the next thing, I, I just walked away a little, and the next time I came to him, I presented a treat. He was baffled. He thought maybe I was going to report him, escalate the issue, and what have you. I gave him a treat, and and I pat him at the back, and he would look at me that, ah, despite what he has done. And I said, do you know it's not good to say to, to, to find a bitch to play around truth. You have to be honest and all those kind of things. He now, now open up more than ever before. He now open up. And now anytime he's trying to be, if I give him high signal, he gets, he gets my message. So may love do more of repair when we embrace this virtue of grace. Somebody has said, if you are a technician and armor is the only tool you have, always correcting, always knocking people on their head, you will do more than damage, more of damage than repair. You need a screwdriver sometimes. You need a sandpaper sometimes. It's not everything that requires armor. Let's put in love. Let's bow down. Let's for prayer. Give me love for my brethren. Love from above. Love from above, love from above. Give me love for my neighbors, love from above. As you love me and died for me. Almighty Father in heaven, we thank you for this teaching. Thank you because of this parable that we have learned from. We thank you for the practical demonstration of love that you showed to us on the cross that even while we were yet sinners, you died for us. You appealed for us while we are yet in blindness. And here we have come. We've seen the light. And we are trusting you. Not just to be a professor of this light, but to put this teaching into practice. To back up our Christian profession with hospitality everywhere we go. That even without too much message, people will get the content of our intention by the expression of our love and affection for them. And as we do that, we pray that you become more profitable in your kingdom in Jesus' name. As we continue service, continue with us, Lord. In Jesus' name, we are prayed. Mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. As we, the, we wait for the others to join us. He has shown thee, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee? But to do 
justly and to love, mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. King of glory, we thank you. We bless your name for the search of scripture this morning. Lord, we pray that as we come to this summary and question time, that you will open our eyes more and more to behold wondrous things from your word. Thank you, Father, for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Any question from what we are taught this morning? You have any question? Raise up your hand. Yes, sister. Any other one? Okay, brother. Okay, sister, you can go then after that, brother. I will take all the questions before. Uh, Good morning, sir. Good morning, church. Um, let me first quickly make a uh, comment before my question. I really thank God for our teacher, the way God helped him to take the teaching this morning, because it's very easy to say, I would wait and I would take you for the man. But I was thinking, what if the person is the one that is going to preach the message and the church is going to wait? So I was telling my partner, of course, you can make a call that someone else take over that why you go and be able to preach or at least take a call let the person come take over before you can leave so i really thank god the way to the teaching now to my question our teacher said god detects holiness without hospitality my first question is is it possible to be holy without being hospitable the next one follows which is if a person, a Christian is, if it's possible that one is, it's possible to be holy without being hospitable, will the person get to heaven? And if not, as Christians, if we find that, that yes, we are living the Christian life, but we are not hospitable and we won't get to heaven, how can we work on that to strike a balance so that we will get to heaven eventually? Thank you. One more time, good morning, church. So, uh, the question is more of a, a narrative way, like the impact of the Good Samaritan um, as compares to Christianity today. The, um, it provides, I mean, the, 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 the teachings of the Good Samaritan provides a vision of life rather than death. It also consists of the fact that enemies can be proven to be neighbors. And it also teaches the fact that compassion has no boundaries. So judging somebody based on ethnicity or religion will leave us all dying in the ditch. So. In contemporary times, like Christians, and referring back to what happened with the priest, did he think that going near somebody who's half dead defied his priesthood? And should we take religion over compassion? Let's take religion out of the way. How about just a feel, the feeling that somebody is dying or is probably crying for help, and you can't go to him because of the position you occupy, because of the position you think you have. Where's the compassion? And with Christians today, it's easy, like our sister just said, to say, oh, okay, um, I have compassion. But in reality, how can you show that compassion when somebody is in need and you can't even offer him help? So that's my contribution. Thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We thank God for the two questions from our brethren. Um, one, uh, to know that 
more than 2,000 times in the scriptures, the Bible talks about the poor. The poor this time, it might not be necessarily uh, the poor in money, but the poor in need. That thief that was caught by arm robbers, that they got him well beaten. I mean, the person that was uh, caught by uh, people that were, uh, they got him beaten, and the good Samaritan came across, is an example that. He's rich in health, but this man is poor in health. He's almost dying, bleeding. And the good Samaritan was able to uh, stretch out himself uh, to help and go an extra mile, as uh, one of her sisters said during the Sage Scripture. Let's look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 27. I'll read from here. Pure religion and undefiled before who? God. Let's open to it. James 1, 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God. A holy religion, all right? And the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That verse alone give, defined us that topic of the search of scripture, holiness with hospitality. It is very difficult from divine perspective to separate holiness and Hospitality, if you profess to a holiness lifestyle, or if you are, let me, let me start from the other side. If you are very good in almsgiving, but there is no holiness, but there is no righteousness, then you will just be numbered among the philanthropists. No gain in heaven. Because First Corinthians make it very, very clear that if, I, I can, if though I bestow all my goods to the poor and have no charity, I have no holiness, what is that? I'm a clanging symbol. No, an empty symbol makes the loudest noise. All right? There are people that they can give everything, but no righteousness, no salvation, no relationship with heaven, no holiness. What happens? They can't make it. Otherwise, there are names, there are big short names here in this country that they are, when you talk about giving, they are very good in giving. But if you are listening to us from the Facebook or from, uh, um, from YouTube or social media there, and you are listed among here, please run to Jesus. Because one thing lacks that mighty works of charity you are, that you are doing. Uh, without Christ, you are, you are work with end here, and you will never make eternity in heaven. So come and join us. Give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and it shall be well with you in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Then let's, come, let's talk to ourselves. Holiness must go with hospitality. Amen? Amen. Holiness will do what? Must go with hospitality. Otherwise, we are carrying a fake holiness about. Look at Proverbs chapter 14, verse 31. Somebody read for us Proverbs 14, 31. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 31. Proverbs. A sister that is ready. After that, I'll give an opportunity for a brother. Yes, go ahead, sister. Proverbs 14, 31. He that oppresses the poor repushes his master 
but he that honoreth him has mercy on the poor. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You see, from what our sister has read, our holiness must have some backing, like Job. All right? Amen? Our holiness must have some backing. Brother, sister, husband and wife, sit down and ask yourself, are there some people somewhere that we can have, like D David? Remember Mephibosheth? Some, somebody in the society that is nobody who cannot have access to the presidency. And Joseph and David sent for Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was brought to the table to, to eat together with the king. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Look at divine testimony about uh, this man called Job. Job chapter 1 verse 8. Somebody should read for us quickly. Job 1 8. Job 1 8. Job's holiness was so much that uh, God has to be proud about Job before Satan. Okay, Job 1 8 says, yeah. And the Lord said unto Satan, mm -hmm. Hast thou considered my servant Job, mm -hmm. that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Praise the Lord. This testimony is from heaven. Turn to the person right and left. Have you heard people say that nobody, no person is perfect, can be perfect? That is a stereotype. It's unscriptural. God himself testified about Job to Satan and said, look, he's a perfect man, an upright man. Amen? It is possible to be perfect. But you understand that Perfect that perfection that Christ, uh, the Lord is talking about, holiness does not mean that you know everything about, you know, uh, holiness and knowledge are different things. Because you look at the life of Job, there was a time he did not understand that things that were happening to him was coming from the devil, all right? That does not mean that he was not perfect. He, he, was, whole, he was living a holy life, amen? And yet he was not, because we are not yet in heaven, when we get to heaven, we have all the knowledge will will be like angels. Amen? But look at Job's life. That holiness did not end there. Look at Job chapter 29, verse 12 to 16. A first reader, please. Job 29, 12 to 16. Job 29, 12 to 16. A sister that's read them, all our sisters uh, you have, who have not read anything, Please, go to the mic quickly, quickly, please. Our sisters, they are very wonderful. Amen? And uh, our brothers, too, are coming up. <laughs> Job 29, verse 12 to 16. All right, Job 29, 12 to 16. Because I delivered the poor that cried, and the fatherless, and him that had none to help him, the blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. Put on righteousness and clothed me. My judgment was as a robe and a diadem. I was the eyes to the blind and feet was I to the lame. I was a father to the poor and, and the cause which I knew not, I searched out. Praise the Lord. Just holiness was not a one that uh, I am holy. You know, I'm holy. I don't care about the poor. I want to get to heaven. You know, pure religion is this. If you have pure religion, you have holiness. That holiness must be demonstrated even with your hand open. Not like this. Open hand. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to end up before we pray in Galatians chapter 2, verse 10. Galatians chapter 2, verse 10. Let's open the Galatians chapter 2, verse 10. Um, Galatians. No, Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, not 2. Galatians chapter 6. Verse 10. We need to examine the kind of holiness we have so that we will not get turned away from the pearly gates. 
when the day reaches. As we have, therefore, opportunity, let us do what? Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are in the household of faith. The priority of our goodness should start, charity begins at home. Amen? Charity to begin where? Baba. Let's sit down and think about the experience, the holiness experience we have. Because um, we thank God that the rapture has not taken place. Because we cannot be in our midst like this and there are brethren in need. And God has given you access to wealth. And you cannot think about the brethren, they say, God, lead me to a brother, a sister in the church. Um, when, when the church started early because of holiness, um, we were taught something that was um, very, very important to avoid any uh, somebody thinking. In those days, um, when you have to give to a, even to a brother or sister, you, you, will, you will buy those things without writing any name. You come and give to the ushers, and they will make announcements, Sister Mary, you have to collect something from the ushers. You go there and collect, but you don't know who has given that thing, so that you will not make that person your God. Amen? Amen? Amen. Sometimes, brethren, they will uh, visit a brother and uh, they will just go and gather all the clothes of that brother, go and wash them and do everything. And before the brother knows it, he just see that these clothes have been ironed and put, put everything in order. Praise the Lord. So the love was flowing. But what do we have today? We have today many are professing holiness, but the holiness is be, not beyond the house. The holiness remains with them. The holiness will not remain with us in Jesus' name. I cannot wait for Kingston because this same Jesus, waving the congressional song, and I was just being blessed because great things are awaiting for us in Kingston in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord and say, God, let my holiness be like that of James chapter 1, verse 27. I don't want to be, I don't want to carry a, a, a fake holiness. I want to carry holiness that is uh, hospitality. I want to have complete holiness. And the Lord will do it for us in Jesus' name. Let's talk to the Lord. I want complete holiness. Holiness that will keep in agenda the orphans, the widows in need. Holiness that will extend to brothers and sisters in the household of faith because there are, God has given us access to wealth with different, different uh, talents, different, different amount of wealth. We should be able to stretch hand to one another and Give a helping hand. What about those? Um, I was just talking with a brother. There are places now back at home in Africa. People are suffering. People are suffering. Do you know that $50, $50 that you stretch out, not that you are giving every time, you give out to somebody in need in the church back home, that's a lot of money. Because there are people that, uh, you see people wear dress, well, like somebody called me from Africa and said, you see people wear dress and they come to you, approach you and said, sister, I have not eaten for the three days. I've not, we've not been able to eat. There is no food. There is hunger all, all over. Can we give a helping hand, even as individually, even as a church, think about them, Think about people here. You know, some of us, we are just waiting for the welfare. Oh, sister, 
Sister Alakwaja is in charge of welfare. Let them go to welfare. No. That holiness does not say that we should only wait for welfare. You as a family, you as an, a, a brother, a uh, bachelor that is, uh, God has blessed you with money, let some people rejoice because of you, that you have remembered them. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this summary and question time. Lord, we pray that you will make us to have true righteousness, true holiness, that we will be like Job, that we will be like Joseph, that will be like Abraham. We sing that Abraham's blessings are mine. Because when Abraham was called, he said, he, he, the Lord said, through him shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Father, we pray that our lives will, will be rivers of living water that will flow and other people will be blessed mightily in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that we'll take record of our life and say, is there anybody like Mephibosheth in the, in the women's section? the Mephibosheth of the brother section, that we can grant them a surprise invitation and they will eat with us in our dining and we will give them the gospel, the saving gospel. Thank you, Father, for everything. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. church good morning all right it's time for praise worship let's all rise and be in the mood of worship we're here today not by our own strength not by our own might we're here because the lord brought us here together brought us here safely Get ready to worship the name of the Lord.
melody of my praise sing from my spirit to my soul until my some praise. Let's be in the mood to praise our God, the living God, the living Jesus. Our hands.
Let's keep on clapping. Let's keep on clapping. Let's keep on clapping. To appreciate the Lord. Let's keep clapping. Let's keep clapping. Give it to the Lord. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. I appreciate the Lord, God Almighty. I appreciate this holy name with your clap, with your praise and worship. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we worship you. Just think, think deep this morning and begin to bless his holy name. For God is wonderful. Our God is great. Our God is powerful. He is the ancient of days, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I am that I am. Lord, we bless you this morning. We worship you, O oh Lord. We adore you. For you are great, you are wonderful. Blessed be your name. We can stand here and just keep thanking God for what he has done for us in our life, in our family. It's not about how much time we spent in his presence, but how far our, our thanksgiving can go in his presence. Let's just use this moment to worship his holy name, to thank him for this new week, to thank him for the weeks that we have spent behind us, to thank him for the months that we have spent, to thank him for the years that have gone and yet we are here in his presence we are still breathing we are walking around we are enjoying in the good health that the lord has blessed us with let's worship his holy name let's thank him let's adore him glory be to your name thank you father in jesus mighty name we worship in jesus name we worship let's have a seat Good morning, church. Uh, before we go into our announcement, if you are here in our midst for the first time worshiping with us, please signify by raising up your hand and uh, standing up so we can welcome you into the praise of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Please, can you stand up, sir, so we can recognize you much better? What do we do? Why? You are welcome in the name. So there will be a mic, uh, media, okay, it's right there by your right. Please uh, just introduce yourself, introduce yourself, just your name and... Uh, praise, the, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. My name is Pastor Ferdinand Soro. I'm at the Kuramo District Church in Nigeria. I visited Lagos. One of my daughters has graduation in university. So that's why I'm here. And one of my sons here also. I say thank you. God bless you. Amen. We welcome you, sir. I pray the Lord will grant you journey, mercy, and the purpose that we should, that we should hear the Lord with Jesus' name. I will pray that uh, the race that we are all running, we all make it and we'll see you there in Jesus' name in heaven. Amen. Um, I also will give you uh, a little uh, pamphlet. Uh, please, you can fill it out so we can follow up with you during the week. Um, if you're there on the Zoom on YouTube, please, um, you can use the chat box there to um, give us the location you're joining from your name, and uh, uh, if you have a prayer request, you can also put it there so that the church can join you in praying and fellowshipping with you as well. And I pray we, as we do so, the Lord will bless us all in Jesus' name. 
uh, there is a quick announcement here. If you have this car, RAV4 with watching tag, J, G, G as in good, J as in joy, G as in good, 1222. Two, two. Again, I will repeat the number. RAV4 Washington DC tag, J as in joy, G as in good, 1222. Two, two. Uh, if, if you are the owner of the car, the window is down, so you can go there and uh, adjust your window for just for safety's sake. Um, so before we do our other announcements, let's get our Bible reading ready. Uh, Bible reading for this morning shall be taken in the book of Matthew chapter 14. Let's get that ready. So uh, there are series of announcements here. The first is our convention. Uh, please, we have been encouraged to do the needs, needful. Um, you know, the hotel is still available. If you need a hotel, reach out to Browebina as soon as possible. But the hostel is already occupied. So there's no more vacancy for the hotel, uh, for the hostel. But for the hotel, reach out to Brother Obina as soon as possible. We know that we have a few weeks, I think 12 or 13 uh, days or so. So please, let's all do the needful for accommodation for the convention. And we pray this same Jesus will come and bless us in Jesus' name. Um, there will be a wedding coming up. Though is a... Is a uh, it's in January, but our brothers and sisters convert our prayer. Brother uh, Kelechi and Sister Deborah, they are young adults in the church. Please let's remember them. Oh. Okay, let's. Yeah. So uh, let's remember them in our prayers that the Lord will make the day a glorious day in Jesus' name. Uh, also, uh, this is for young adults or anyone in the school. We all need help at you know, some point in our journey of life. So this is a scholarship opportunity for, I don't know if you all see it on the platform, the church platform. Uh, if you are in need of uh, funding for your education, there's an open door for you to apply. The Dream, uh, Deeper Life Dreams Scholarship Fund for 2024, uh, the application is still open till October 9. Please, you can use that window to grab this opportunity if you need funding for your education. Uh, let's do that as soon as possible. Um, now for our housing project, please. It is, uh, it is a blessing that we are able to have this uh, building and we have opportunity of occupying this space and also acquiring the, the, the building beside us. If you have made a pledge or you are still thinking about it, please, let's do it as soon as possible because we are running out of time. Uh, I pray the Lord will bless us and uh, we'll do mighty work with our substance in Jesus' name. Uh, if you are yet to redeem your pledges, do so as soon as possible. And I believe our pastor will speak more today. Um, So let's, the media. Welcome to church. We are so glad to have you here this morning. This is Deeper Life Bible Church, Washington, D.C., there will be many opportunities to fellowship with us during the week, so please listen closely to the following announcements. On Sundays, we begin with intercessory prayers at 8.30 a.m. and the service starts at 9 a.m. Later on Sunday evenings, we meet in smaller units for house caring fellowship. Make sure to get connected to your fellowship unit before the end of today's service. We believe the Holy Bible is the true word of God. That is why we meet every Monday at 6.20 p.m. as our founder, Pastor W.F. Kumuyi takes us through the scriptures. Join us this Monday as we study the word together. If you're a senior citizen, I invite you to come join us on Wednesdays from 6 to 7 p.m. for an evening with Jesus. During this time, we encourage ourselves in the Lord as we worship with one another. Seniors, don't miss this time of fellowship. 
All children are welcome to join the Kids Bible Discussion every Thursday at 6 p.m. This is a fun time where we learn about Jesus, His Word, and how we can live for Him. Join us this Thursday. I hope to see you there. Youth, get excited for your weekly fellowship every Thursday at 7 p.m. It's a time for us to study God's Word together so that we can be all that He has called us to be. What a great place to be. You can't miss it for anything. Fridays are a time for revival service where we hope to be encouraged and strengthened as we continue to seek the Lord. Join us this Friday at 6.20 p.m. for a time of seeking the Lord. Every third Friday is our community fellowship. Make sure to be part of this avenue for soul winning and let's impart our word for the Lord. Offering time, blessing time. Blessing time, offering time. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9 tells us to honor the Lord with our substance and with the first fruit of our increase. If you brought tithes and offerings, please bring them out now. Before we give our offering, let's read our Bible reading for this morning. Matthew chapter 14. Bible reading, Matthew chapter 14, before the offering. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. And he sent, and beheaded John in the prison. And his head was brought in a charger, and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came, and took up the body, and buried it, and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake, and gave the loaves to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat, and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about five thousand men, beside women and children. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship, and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. 